This is what the next Mac Pro could be if Apple wanted to dominate the workstation market. It's got a fast, efficient workstation ARM CPU. It's got tons of RAM, but you can add more if you want. It has expansion slots so pros can add on what they need without fragile Thunderbolt connections. It's in a quiet, mid-sized tower case, and it costs less than 5,000 bucks. Except Apple doesn't make this. This is the Ampere Ultra developer platform, and it's powered by a 96-core monster CPU. This processor powers cloud computing and data centers around the world. It's using CPU cores called Neoverse N1, which have a similar architecture to Apple's M-series chips, but without a built-in GPU. But that's alright, because the expansion slots mean you can put in whatever GPU you want, even NVIDIA. If Apple wants to be a player in the workstation market, maybe it's time for Apple and NVIDIA to bury the hatchet. This machine certainly has what it takes for AI and machine learning. You might even see the RTX 8000 in there. Does it work? Well, I'll get to that later. For Apple, there's not a whole lot of expansion options for Apple's M-series CPUs, at least not yet. I mean, you could buy a special rack mount enclosure for 1700 bucks that lets you add a few PCI Express cards, but compatibility is limited. But let's play a game of what if. What if Apple wanted to build a new workstation that's every bit as flexible and professional as the 2009 Mac Pros were? What if Apple could still have their annoying but blazing fast RAM on chip architecture, but have an upgradable daughter card so you could upgrade your Mac? What if Apple could have built-in expansion so pros could build amazing multimedia processing or storage powerhouses? And what if Apple could still have blazing fast internal storage in the form of standard NVMe slots? Well, they could. This machine has most of that, though in this case you can at least upgrade your RAM independent of the CPU. This daughter card even uses a standard called COMHPC. COMHPC is kind of like the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 I use a lot, but like on massive steroids. For a lot of people who use Macs, they might be like, so what? Well, there are a lot of people who use Mac Pros, and for good reason. Like, take me for instance. I do video editing, and I need to transfer tons of large files on my network. I have a 10 gig connection on my Mac Studio, and that's great and all, but did you know that 25, 40, or even 100 gig networks are a thing now? Even using Thunderbolt, I can't get those beats. I need PCI Express. Pro Mac users have two options. One, buy an old Mac Pro and don't take advantage of Apple's fast and efficient M-series chips, or two, be jealous of their PC friends who can just pop cheap 25 gig cards in their custom PCs. But I think the main reason Apple hasn't built a machine like this yet is they haven't figured out how to upcharge people 700 bucks for casters. Taking a quick peek at this machine, it's called the Ampere Ultra Developer Platform, and you can buy it from this website starting around 3000 bucks. This comes as a full custom PC with a case, power supply, motherboard, and everything else you need for the fastest ARM desktop on the planet, including this quiet water cooling setup. But if you want to build your own, Edlink has you covered with this dev kit that gives you all the guts. You can build in your own case with your own power supply, RAM, and SSD, and that saves you a few hundred bucks. But if you've ever built a PC before, you might notice that this motherboard's a little different. That's because it uses a processor, RAM, and VRM daughter card using a standard called COMHPC. This lets you swap out the daughter card if you want to upgrade your computer. Adlink even makes express sizes of these boards with Intel chips. But there's one other weird little chip on this motherboard, and it's something you'll find on servers a lot, but not as much on desktops. This A-speed chip connects over to this Ethernet port and runs something called a BMC, or Board Management Controller. It's always on, and it lets you manage the PC over your network, even when it's turned off. Ampere sent me this machine for testing after they saw all my videos on graphics cards on Raspberry Pis. This is a custom 96-core version. It has 96 ARM cores running at 2.8 GHz each. Mine came with a 128 gig NVMe SSD and 64 gigs of RAM, and I added another SSD in this graphics card. Out of the box, it runs Ubuntu 2004, but you can run a bunch of other operating systems on it. Unlike ARM SBCs, or even Macs for that matter, this thing has a special system-ready certification. And that means most generic operating systems should just work on it. That's a lot different than ARM SBCs like the Raspberry Pi or Orange Pi, where you need custom Linux images. To test this out, I downloaded Ubuntu 2204 and installed it without any issues at all. What about Windows? Well, I'll get to that later. So now that I have a nice desktop OS running, I wanted to see how this workstation class hardware performs. And the first thing I ran? Geekbench. 
Geekbench is far from perfect, but it's fun to run since it's been run on anything from multiprocessor servers down to single board computers. This system got an 807 for single core, which isn't all that fast, about on par with 6th or 7th gen Intel CPUs, but you don't go Ampere for single core performance. The multi-core score of 30,121 is faster than any other CPU I've personally tested, and there's room for improvement. There may be some buggy tests in Geekbench 5 that don't take advantage of all 96 cores, and I haven't run the preview release of Geekbench 6 for ARM yet. A more practical benchmark is the one they use to test the fastest supercomputers in the world when they get ranked in the top 500. I ran the high-performance Linpack benchmark using my open-source top 500 benchmark project. The first time I ran it, I just had it spread linear math equations out to all 96 cores as fast as it could. That gave me 377 gigaflops at 220 watts, giving me an efficiency of 1.71 gigaflops per watt. That's already fast, but we can do better. My grandma always said, mind your P's and Q's, and apparently she knew how to benchmark. I remembered reading this article from Anantech and seeing the discussion about Ampere's core layout. You see, the way these chips work, there's kind of a mesh that defines how cores communicate with each other. And when you have 96 CPU cores trying to talk, things can get a little noisy. So much so that by optimizing code to run differently, not requiring coordination between all the cores, you can actually get faster performance. So I split the job up into four quadrants. Switching to 4P in 24 Qs, the score was much better, hitting 401 gigaflops at 200 watts with an efficiency of 2.01 gigaflops per watt. So we got 6% more performance and 16% more efficiency, all just by optimizing the software. We could probably get even more performance too. I love doing tests like this because it illustrates two things. First, single benchmark numbers are meaningless. Keep that in mind whenever you're looking at reviews. And second, with modern chip architecture, software support is just as important as hardware to unlock all the performance. That's why you sometimes see unintuitive results with chips like AMD's new Ryzen 9 7950X3D. When software has to wait for die-to-die -die or quadrant-to-quadrant -quadrant communications, things can actually run slower than if they were just running on one portion of the chip. I also recompiled the Linux kernel because that's kind of my thing, and this thing will do that in a little under two minutes. Not bad at all. That, along with benchmarks like 7-zip compression and PHP bench, puts the CPU in the upper end of performance, but it's not the top dog. Most of the time, that honor goes to AMD's latest Epic chips. Those things are monsters when it comes to performance. But this chip does shine in some areas, like for web servers, and especially for efficiency, at least under load. My Mac Studio still owns the efficiency crown, which is why I'd love to see Apple make a true pro workstation. But the Ampere is a lot more efficient than x86 for most workloads, which is why so many cloud providers are switching to it. But speaking of x86, for most desktops, that means Windows. Can you install Windows on this thing? Well, apparently some people have, but speaking from first-hand experience, it ain't easy. The first thing I tried was finding a Windows on ARM ISO. They don't have one of those using the Windows Media Creation tool. So then I found this Windows 11 on ARM Insider Preview, which requires an Insider account. Well, that's okay, I already have one, except apparently my account is blocked for some reason. I get this error when I try downloading it. And I tried Safari, Firefox, and Chrome. I even tried Edge on my Windows 11 PC, and nothing worked. Eventually, I got a hold of the Windows Insider Twitter account, and they said to slide into their DMs. Well, I did, but they haven't resolved that problem yet. So next, I built a custom ISO using this tool called UUP Dump, but the image it generated just resulted in this synchronous exception, and the installer wouldn't boot. So at this point, I cried out for help on Twitter, and a bunch of people offered me suggestions, ranging from installing Parallels or VMware Fusion on my Mac, to using other UUP tools, to even downloading a recovery image for my Windows dev kit. That seemed like the easiest path forward, though the illustration for where to find the serial number is pretty useless. It's down here on the bottom, in case you're wondering. So I hit download and waited. Apparently they rate limit that thing to 10 megabytes per second. Come on, Microsoft, I'm really trying to let you have a win here. Anyway, after it downloaded, I expanded it, used the recovery tool, copied over all the files for another 10 minutes, and finally I had this recovery drive. Will it work? No, because of course not. So next up was a suggestion from Paul on Mastodon to download Parallels and use it to get an ISO. So I did that, and that got Further, I mean, I couldn't see Windows in the BIOS, but it did start booting. But then I got the blue screen of death. I was about to give up when I found this article from Cloudbase. I, I mean, it sure seems like they got it working. 
So I got help from David Burgess over on DB Tech. Apparently he's able to download the Windows on ARM Insider build, so he did that and sent it to me. I converted it from a VMDK file to a raw disk image, then copied that onto the NVMe drive on the machine. And after a reboot, it looked like I could pick it in the BIOS. But will it work? Well, it, it's working so far. Gah, that dumb blue screen. It looks like I'm still getting a BIOS error. So hey, Linux works great on here. Windows, I don't know. I think Microsoft just hates me at this point, but I'll keep trying. I mean, it looks like it's possible. And I just wanted to try some x86 Windows binaries on this machine to see how they perform with emulation. All in good time, I guess. It's also a good time to test a few different graphics cards. In my last video, I tested a bunch of overpowered cards on my Raspberry Pi, and almost none of them worked. But on Ampere, there's a list of approved graphics cards, and supposedly some other ones should work too. But before that, one question I know you're dying to ask is, will it play Doom? Of course, and it has no problem with that at all. I also played Super Tux Kart, and well, it needs a graphics card if you want it to look good. So I spent a few hours trying to get this RTX 8000 working. Just like on the Pi, it was recognized, and I could install NVIDIA's ARM drivers, but I still ended up getting this RM init adapter failed error, and I couldn't get the card working. I'll keep plugging away though, so expect another video on gaming on the fastest ARM desktop in the world soon. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.